This morning I want to talk about needs. Needs in our lives. Many, along with me, we have uh, areas of need in our lives, your life, my life. And that's pretty congregational. And uh, I presume whoever there was an honest congregation would be that response. I'm not going to, I, I am going to bring my, my message with this teaching with a view for us getting some response as a result from God and from our own obedience. I want to turn to Luke chapter 6 and verse 6, Luke 6 and verse 6. Father, we ask you to give us wisdom and understanding during this teaching. We thank you, but all the time we need it. We need it all the time. Just a simple prayer. The eyes of our understanding would be opened, that we'd comprehend you and your word through your word. It's your word. The only way we're going to know you is the word. All of our senses are attuned to so many different things. I can listen to some of the most wonderful, beautiful music, like Mozart and Bach, and a lot of the classicals and modern, but I get the same goosebumps that I get when the Holy Spirit is upon me. So I only have one feeler, and it fills everything. So I need your word. Your word is you. I won't know Jesus beyond your word. I can't trust my senses most of the time about those things. I learned it to tune them, but still yet, it's your word. Stand on your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. As we go into this word this morning, I need to, uh, well, as every word that we, we go into, I assure you this, I don't feel pontifical as I go into this and preach. I don't lord over you. I don't better than anybody. And, and less than. I think of the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle at all, because I persecuted the church of God. Well, I don't remember persecuting the church of God, but there are many times when I preach and teach, I get, I used to get pretty, but not anymore, but I used to get pretty vigorous and demonstrative, look like I spoke down to people, but I, I wasn't. I'm very much aware that I'm sitting in that seat you're sitting in right now. And if God choose to say something through this and through me, well, I'll hear it. You'll hear it too. I hope you understand that. This is a sharing. It's not a denunciation of anything. It's a heart sharing, heartfelt feeling. So when we're through, maybe God will have some medicine in there somehow, somewhere. I pray we'll all be the better for being exposed to him and his word. The word's important, the most important thing. It's the most. Luke chapter 6, verse 6. It happened on another Sabbath, came to pass. Also, then he entered in the synagogue and taught. And a man was there, whose right hand was withered and was deformed. So the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely, whether he'd heal on the Sabbath or not. That they might find an accusation against him, trump something up against him. But he knew the thoughts, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, he was he knew aware, he was aware of it. Now rise up and stand here, he said. Get get out here in the middle where everybody can see you. Get up and stand over here. Stand in front. Everybody see it. The Living Bible says this. Come stand here where everyone can see you. Hmm. The 20th century version of the Bible says this. Our Lord said to the man, stand up and come out in the middle. Take a, let him take a look at you. And then he got up and then he went forward. And so Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful? On the Sabbath, to do good or evil, is it 
is it lawful? To save life or to destroy it? She's looking at him. And then he looked around at them all. He, they looked at him. He got a ball on him. He said to the man in anger, in anger, he said to them, they looked at them in anger. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other one, completely restored. What a miracle. Can you imagine being there, crunching and bones popping? And they were filled with rage. Well, I got upset. And Dr. Goodspeed said that they were perfectly furious about this. And they discussed one another how they could affect his murder, how they might take care of that, another way to kill him. Nice. They were nice folks, weren't they? I've talked to my wife about this. Were they the mafia? What were they? No, they were religious people. They were the, they were the people to kill you. They seem like underworld characters, right? No, they weren't. These were the religious leaders of the day. Mad at Jesus. They're always mad at Jesus. <laughs> mad at God all the time. Walked in their midst. You see me, you seen the Father. <laughs> he was always making them mad. Now, I'm reading, reading the Gospels, and I'll say it to you this way. And often as I've read through the Gospels, there's something very distinctive about the Gospels. And reading the Gospels, and uh, you're reading a very selective uh, collection of sayings and actions of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle John, in his gospel, he provides us with a insight as to why the things that are written in the gospel were selected the way they were. Very distinct. He said this, that the miracles that he recorded in his gospel were signs. That's what he said. He also said this, if all the things that Jesus said or did had been recorded, the world would be unable to hold them and records necessary to such an accountant. That's probably a, he's a hyperbole, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> a, legitimate exa a legitimate exaggeration to make a point. But it, it has some literality to it. It's a fact that in the Gospels we have far from the full account of all that Jesus said and did. Now that raises the next question. Why was this event chosen and that one not? I've thought of that many times. Who in the final analysis chose what should be recorded? The Holy Spirit did. For Jesus had guaranteed the accuracy of the word and the coming record that was going to be made when he said to them, he explained to them, the Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things and everything that I want done. Whatever the Holy Spirit want brought to the remembrance to be recorded, then it was divinely intended as being something special put in the words. We'd have books that were thick, thick, thick with things he said and did. Now, John, he said the signs. I don't want to revert to the allegorical for, uh, uh resort to allegory in the Bible. It's legitimate to say this. There were things that Jesus said and did which literally happened, which had a, a larger meaning and were very significant of something beyond the happening itself. We had to have it. When he healed a blind man, he manifested himself as Jesus, the light of the world. When he fed the, fed the multitude, he manifested himself as Jesus, the bread of life. These are signs. They're simple. Nothing makes more suspicious about everything I find in the gospel as not only a hand-picked account of something put in there for a reason. It's a historical fact. There's events and things that occurred, that, but they had that significance that if you look at them closely, they have some timeless significance, don't they? That's what he said. 
And I hope you got that. Now, I want to reconstruct this picture for you. Jesus, in the beginning of his ministry, he went to the synagogues. He went to the temples and the synagogues. You read it and you see it. Now, Jesus had a sense of continuity, as did the apostles. Even though Judaism was apostate and, and uh, the temple was full of rascals and brigands and Sanhedrins were, were the ones who put Jesus to death, and he knew they would. Yet he realized that they did represent the ongoing of something that had been done in history in his name, and he didn't ignore it. He went to the synagogues and he went to the temple. And the time came when the temple was destroyed and the synagogues were no longer a place where Christians were welcome. But as long as they would hear him, he went there. As long as they listened to him, he went. Now, probably for two reasons I'm thinking about it. One, to rebuke the apostasies that was, uh, that was present with these men who turned wicked in the things of God. And two, to redeem as many as possible, to redeem them out of the synagogue in a system that was destined for destruction. He loved those priests. He wanted to get them out of there. He always said, always go to the priest and show yourself. How often did that happen? They came to the Sabbath on this particular day. He looked over the audience, and glanced at things. He saw a man with a withered hand in the audience. He had that withered up hand. You know, we don't know exactly how it appeared, but but he spotted him and got him. And I don't know how his hand looked. He hung down to the side, no control, or just withered. When I was a boy, we had a, a young man, a boy that was my brother's friend who had a withered hand, a little withered hand, so I know what it looked like. But it's obvious that his right hand was not functional because it was, it was deformed, it was withered, something deformed, it didn't grow. So, as he looked at this, looked over the crowd, he he got him, he got him pretty well scoped out, and the religious leaders were watching him. They were pretty catchy. They had people on him all the time. They looked for some kind of irregularity, something that he did wrong, so they could six, so they could six successfully discount him with everything he did. I want to turn the people against him. The Bible said he watched him closely to see if he he was going to do any healing on the Sabbath. So they were used to that. He was going to do something. Something like healing. And he saw with the with a hand man with a withered hand there. Look at that. You know, and he called him forth. And he healed him. And they were mad at him. Now, that's pretty much what he was going to happen anyway. Now that's the story. Let's, let's take it apart and let's look at it. And let's apply it as much as we can. Kind of a simple teaching, but it's not. I want to speak first of all about the poverty of religion, which I have seen this, struggled through it, wondered about it. If you listen carefully to the reading this morning, there were a lot of religious words that came up, Sabbaths, synagogues, and scribes, and Pharisees. This was a very religious setting, a lot of religion, a bunch of religion. Preachers and uh, religious leaders in general. Holy days, synagogue, the rose of the Torah. The trappings and the clappings of the Judaism activity is very religious. Lots of religion going on. I want you to think about that yourself in our churches. Now, in the midst of all this concentrated religion and religious doings, representations of it, there was a man sitting in the midst of it with a withered hand. He's all withered up. Imagine that. God goes there and he's trying to show you something. And the religious leaders, they put them all together there. The religious leaders said, we know the reputation of this guy. We know what he'll do to this man. His reputation anyway. And I wonder if he's going to try to do something for that man with a withered, withered hand, right hand. I wonder if he's going to try to fix it today. Now, it's the Sabbath and those kind of activities. 
shouldn't go on on Sabbath. More rules. <laughs> this is interesting to me. Because these powerless, loveless Pharisees, these men, they were more interested in perpetuating religious tradition than they were in helping any man or animal. <laughs> what did you on the Sabbath? He's incomplete. Needed to help him. But they didn't interest in that. They weren't going to do that. They were more interested in damning the Savior than saving the damned. If you look at it, it's horrible. Now, that's extreme, but it's true. Now, I'm convinced that we've all touched the hypocrisy and indecency of the attempt on the part of religious people to perpetuate certain dead forms of religion and no customs and while at the same time allowing that could be helped by the living God to continue in the deformity of some sort, pain, hurt, some sort. I need to say this a little, I'll touch on it a little. I was sent by the Lord. The Holy Spirit sent me, talked right to me. He said, I want you to minister in this church or that church, this church. And I've already talked to the pastor about it. Every one of these pastors didn't like me. The reason was, is I didn't like religion and I have never liked religion. I will never like religion of any sort. I don't like organizations, which need be, but I don't like them because they get ingrained in poverty, ingrained in humanism, ingrained in what's man-made. They stopped listening to the Holy Spirit because I found if you listen to the Holy Spirit and you do what he wants to do, or according to the kingdom of God, government of God, what God wants, it'll hair lip everybody out there. And that's just a saying, it'll make them mad. It makes churches mad. I had one pastor introduce me. The Lord, he said this, the Lord talked to me last night and I stayed up all night talking with Jesus. And I said, I was listening. I went there because I was supposed to go there that morning. The Lord had talked to me that morning early, woke me up early, said, get dressed and go over here. So I went to this man's church just to see. And I had had uh, dealings with his family, but, but he was, uh, he was, uh, he was a good man. He loved the Lord and he liked people, but poverty stricken, religious doings. And he said, I've talked to the Lord all night. They fought with him because he wanted this man that I'm going to introduce to minister in my church. And I said, I don't like him. I don't like what he teaches. He's arrogant. He's, he's, uh, he's, he, he's just arrogant about you. He's talking to Jesus. And Jesus told him several times, I, I want him to minister today. So as I, I stood up, he introduced me. Well, this is the man that's supposed to minister to you. God told me, so here he is. Now, that was quite the introduction of hate. I felt, I felt like Jesus. I went, uh, you know, I, no, you're not better than your master. <laughs> they spit on him and beat him to death. Well, they're not going to do you too good either. But I, it, coming out of a church, I wouldn't think they'd do that to me, but they did. So the Lord anointed me with the gifts of the Spirit for two weeks. Every gift you could possibly imagine came out of me and just baffled everybody. But the hate from the elders was incredible. They loved their poverty. Their love, they loved their, their self-pity. They loved this little group got together and they just woed each other. Whoa, 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 it's us. He did divine healings, divine health. It's a wonder he didn't raise the dead that, that those two weeks. I was looking for it. I had a little boy that came up to me and said, and while I was ministering and, and didn't get to teach, I talked about Jesus and we did some ministry about Jesus. That's about it. The, the gifts of the spirit flowed and we weren't talking about swinging off the chandeliers or rolling on the floor. We're talking about words of wisdom, words of knowledge, gift of faith, gift of healings. I'm just power. And the little boy came up to me and he said, could, could you pray for me? And I said, sure. I stopped the service right there. He was about 10. I said, what do you need? And he said, my mother's a drug addict. Our home is torn up. And things are bad and getting ready to happen. I want my mama saved and I want her off of drugs. And I said to him, I looked at him and the power of faith. I have never had that. They came on to me and I said, your mama will be saved on Thursday and delivered on Thursday. 
and next Sunday she'll be here and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I said that, and there was no, you know, I can't believe I said that type thing. It was just, there we go. The next Sunday I came there, he came up with his mama. She got delivered from drugs on Thursday. I don't know how. He didn't say. And born again. And Sunday, she got filled with the Holy Spirit that day. And that little boy was happier and happier. Because his fam God put his family back together. Somebody had to show up with the anointing. The power of God needed to be there. People needed to function. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I was never accepted there. The last day I went out, one of the elders handed me five dollars as a sneer in the church. He sneered at me here, take this, I'm supposed to give you this five dollars. And it's mean. And I said thank you. I wasn't mean. I did not become mean back. And I can. I wasn't going to. So I took his five dollars and took it over to the jar. We were burying sister so and so. And this is her their money jar to get the burial done. So I put his five dollars in the burial jar and prayed for him. And as we were leaving, the elders had to follow me to the door and follow me out to my truck and uh, told me how much they didn't like me on a regular basis. Just regular. Every four or five minutes, one of them had something bad to say. And then the pastor came out there and he says, are you leaving? I said, yeah, I'm leaving right now. And uh, he called his dogs off me, I guess, if you want to call it that. They went back inside. I guess they were born again. I don't know. You guess you could be born again and be mean like that. I guess they thought I was a false prophet or something. I have no idea. Arrogant. Because I was sure about what God was doing. I wasn't going to be, well, I don't know, brothers. He may help us. He may not. I don't know. Let's, well, maybe he will. I, I want him to. We're praying for this and we need that. No. Faith. You have a relationship with Jesus. As I was leaving, I said, I'm not coming back. Don't I don't have to now. I've been discharged. And it was like a sigh of relief came over him. Oh, we were kind of pushing things anyway. That elder gave me $5. I said, he did. Kind of rough about it. I said, that's all. He said, that's all the money he had for gasoline. I said, well, a good place to give it. Give it to the Lord. Not to me. And as I was driving away, I was thinking about it. And I said, you know, I can't imagine Jesus going through this. Every time he went into the synagogue, they beat him up. He wanted them all saved. He wanted them all healed. He wanted their bills paid. He wanted food on their table. And uh, physically prosperous. And things happen. Things don't. But I do believe what Jesus wants you taken care of. But it was religious. It was a religious form. It was expressed in the Good Samaritan, too, as well. It, it thought about that a lot. That's the man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and got beat badly and threw him alongside the road. He lay half dead alongside the road, bleeding out. It was a mess. Imagine that lay there on the road, helpless to help himself, couldn't get up. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's pretty rough. And Jesus was about to give one of his science stories. He said, along came a Levite. And he looked at the man and eyeballed him and passed by him on the other side of the road. Along came a priest, did the same thing. He looked at the man and passed, passed by him along the side of the road. Now, both of these men represented the Yahweh, somehow, the God who is concerned and bloody beat up people. He does. Now, they both went by on the other side. Religion for them was has been reduced to what the people could do for them instead of what they could do for the people. <laughs> Therefore, that beat up man there, lying there destitute and bleeding to death had nothing to contribute to them whatsoever. So looking at him, they saw that there's no profit in him. There's no percentage in him. There's no tithe in him. He wasn't even good for an offering. He'd beat up, bleeding. Let's leave him alone. Passed by on the other side. There was no profit in that. Now a certain Samaritan came, and Jesus' choice of Samaritan was designed to do exactly what it did. Grind on them. <laughs> Just grind on them. They hated Gentiles, but they hated Samaritans even worse. Gentiles were out and out 
Goya dogs. They didn't like them. But the Samaritans were half breeds. They hated the half breeds, were hate, they hated the out and out Gentiles. Now, Jesus chose to liken himself to a Samaritan. He said a certain Samaritan came along and saw him where he was and went to him and laying down and poured oil and wine on him, healed him, killed him up, bound him up, and cleaned him up, and put him on his own beast, and held him on and took him to the inn and turned him over to the inn and said, Look, if he uh, put this money down for his care, then when I come back, if he owns any more, I'll pay it. If he gets curse than he did, I'll pay that. Now, there's a beautiful picture of the whole redemptive work of Christ. Now, we don't have time to go into that, but s still there was. If you, if you see that, the religious people were disinterested, the poor man, for the simple reason that he wasn't able to contribute to them. He was in very many ways, he was a violation of any of their decent religious protocol. Poverty religion is what I called it. And I've always called that. The tragedy. That's what religion offers. Very little of anything. You feed it and it don't do nothing for you. And you have to stand, all of us have to kind of stand there a little bit. And that rebukes Jesus, rebukes the people about. Let's look at the significance of the, 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 the wither up hand now. What was that significant of? Now Jesus killed, he healed every kind of sickness. Now what is this about a withered right hand? It's a wonder, so let's look at it. Makes me wonder. Is that just part of the story? Was was that chosen? Was it deliberately chosen by the Holy Spirit? Did it have all the parts it needed to tell us what we're trying to hear? Now look, you look around that synagogue, there were people that needed healings. They needed things. The devils were out there. This was a time it was intense. They knew Jesus of Nazareth was there. They said so. Why are you here? What have you to do with us? Not what uh, have we to do with you, but what have you to do with us? You come here pointing out things. You're coming into our mafia. You're coming into our, our, our business. And that's demonic as well as human. They were all working against the human beings. And Jesus was right in the middle of it. And so they, they were saying that, you know, they said that from synagogue to synagogue. Well, he's here, he's here. And he told them all, shut up. Don't make me known like this. I'm trying to get them all in and just shut up. He said that to the demons on a regular basis. So what in the world did he pick that man out for? It's just, it's just somebody else. There's a lot of other things there he could have done, probably. But he picked this man out. What does it mean? All this religion was around him, and there's the son of Israel, and Right, the congregation, son of Israel with a withered hand, a withered right hand. Now, the right hand in the Bible is symbolic of uh, authority and power, and uh, it stands for strength, for, it stands for ability, it stands for livelihood as well. There's a lot of meaning to it. It stands for warfare, and protection, unless, of course, you're left handed. <laughs> Everything I say about the right hand, if you transfer that over to the left hand, it's your strong hand, your strength. The right hand traditionally has a very significant metaphorical meaning. It's your strength. Now, here's the son of Israel. Here's the child of Abraham, covenant man, in the midst of the whole religious setting, and his right hand is paralyzed. Now, you, we're going to church, or we're going to see Jesus. He has no authority, can't provide himself with a livelihood and with that hand. His right hand or strong hand is withered. That's, that's the, that meant more than the man. That man in that congregation with the withered right hand was typical of an entire nation that was withered. No good. Religion had got in. The entire nation of Israel at that point was withered. It was subject to Roman domination. It was full of fighting within itself. It was a paralyzed people. And what Jesus saw was that man represented the nation of Israel at that time, right now, a nation that should have been vital and powerful and authoritative. They should have been speaking to the world and, uh, and subject to civility under the heel of Rome. It had been paralyzed and became a paralyzed right arm, right hand. Now, I want to say this. The hand is not meant to be withered. That's not what it was meant for. That's not why it was put together. If you've ever hurt your hands, 
damage your hands, it, it slows your way down. The divine intention of this has been interfered with. It's been inferred. It, it, it just been interfered with, interfered with. Now, what I'm saying here today, right now, is that there are some of us withered. Now, there's a lot of titles of this. Uh, crippled Christians, <laughs> little titles. And now there's shriveled saints. It's, it's not said to be unkind. and I'm trying not to be, but I have seen so much. How many of us wear this morning of barely existing, of the irreducible meaning of spiritual awareness? Again, look, there, there's been times I was always chastised pretty much in the church. Whenever I went up again, the pastors would call me in. I was a younger shepherd, pastor. And they'd call me in and say, you've got to quit casting demons out of Christians. I said, I'm not casting demons out of Christians. They were harassing the Christian. I don't know where they were. I couldn't see it whether in them or on top of them or around them, they were forcing those people to death. Uh, there was a woman that came to our church. It was a big church. And she had depression problems. And she was depressed and suicidal at times. So they, they got her in touch with the doctors. I didn't pray over her much. They got her. They got her. Introduced to the doctors who gave her pills to, you know, settle her down. To, Let's get these moves all straightened out. So she got to the point where she didn't feel anything. And one evening, a friend of mine says, would you come with me? I need to minister to a lady. I'm going to go over to her house. She just called. She was a friend of theirs. Um, he knew of her. And he said, could you come with me? And I said, sure, I'll come with you. And we went over there, and I had been fasting for a few days. I just did what the Lord led me. And I'd listened to the word a lot because I was a contractor too. So I put earphones on and I listened to the Bible. I'm almost all day just because I didn't have to talk to anybody much. And as we went over there, uh, the anointing was very strong. And I didn't hear much about things, but I'd you pay attention. And as we got there, knocked on the door, went in. We just went in. And this woman had a 38 pistol to her forehead, to her temple. And she said, if I don't get relief right now, I am I'm killing myself. And I looked over at the pistol, and, and uh, I had been raised a military man in the NRA. We hunted. I knew about gun safety real well. Had rifles and pistols myself. And this was loaded and cocked. And she was serious. And I said, if she could just mess around and pull that trigger a little bit, she'll pop her head. It's not good. And I talked to her about Jesus. We both did a little bit. And uh, the Lord said, I did hear this inside. Too much talk, more action. Reach over and get that gun. So I reached right over there and I put my finger over the hammer, between the hammer and the, the bullet. The firing pin was not going to hit. If she, if she pulled the trigger, it wouldn't go off. And grabbed the whole thing, pulled it out of her hand. And he said, cast that demon of depression out of her and suicide out of her right now. And I cast it out. She fell down. She was sitting there. And she just fell over on the couch. She come back up speaking in tongues. She was happy. She was joyful. And she said, those are just demons? I said, yeah, it looks like it. She went back to this mega church, which had seven or 8,000 people in it. And she chewed out the pastor and the other pastors that were there and said this, Mike Baker cast the devil out of me and I'm whole complete now. I'm not taking them drugs anymore and I'm going to another doctor. So I got killed, called into the into the office on that one. Got chewed out real good for that. I'm not supposed to cast demons out of her. That was really wrong for me to do because Christians can't have demons. And I said, does she look like she needed medicine anymore? No. And, and I'm, not tell, I'm not talking as being an irresponsible man. My wife was an RN, had been one for years. Went to pre-med and changed her major to to uh, nursing, and she had her bachelor's and was headed for her master's. She had two degrees other than that already. It's not as if she was ignorant, nor I, as a mechanical engineer and worked as a mechanical contractor and had my licenses. You have to, you have to be fairly academic and <laughs> common sense. But I was standing there before, and I was about had it with, with the whole church thing. I had pretty, it pretty much made me mad when I said, well, Jesus did these things, and Jesus did that, and Jesus did this in the synagogues and church where they didn't have much power. And it doesn't seem like we have much power 
it's kind of bothering me when Jesus said to do these things and I'm doing them, and then you turn around and tell me not to do them. What am I supposed to do? And this went on for about a year or so, and my little home cell group got up to about 125 people in my home instead of five or ten, and I broke it off and put it in another home three times. Keep it small, and the pastor called me in again. He said, we had people at your Bible study. I said, yes, sir, I saw them. And he said, please don't start a church. I said, I have no intention of starting a church. Well, don't start a church. People come there with all kinds of miracles, they say. And I said, yeah, that does happen on a regular basis. There's a, there's a bunch of things. Saw cancer fall off a woman. Uh, put body parts put back in people as we're talking about the word, as we're preaching the word. We said, and he was being fairly kind to me and said, please don't start a, a church. And we had discussed things about this. It upsets me that people go to a religious center. It's different now. In my last 20 years has changed a lot. They have some very good services, very good outpouring of God's spirit and the word of God where it teaches people what to do and how to do it, what's right, if they obey the Lord properly. But there are so many millions that are just dead churches, man-made uh, religion, do what you're told to do and shut up and sit down type deals, which I just don't think is right. And I te teach people on an individual basis how to call upon the Lord. Yes, I do believe in corporate anointings. I believe we believe in church. And I believe in, 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 in the corporate body of Christ. Because most of the New Testament that Paul preached and Peter and Jude and the rest, they were talking to the body. They weren't talking to individuals so much. It's not like you got born again. It's like these are the redeemed Christians around the world. The church. The church. And I see so many people suffering in the church. Because they won't let people like me get in there, stir it up, get Jesus moving in the midst, the Holy Spirit moving in the midst of the people. Because that's how it works. There's a way to do certain things. And and I don't, you know, as you, as you go into the church and you start talking to people and you visit with people and you say, you know, how you getting along? And uh, somebody will say to you, well, I'll keep my head above water. And I'm, it's, I, to me, it's like, you know, okay, here we go. That's the wrong part of your anatomy. I think your feet supposed to be the water here, not just your head. Your feet needs to be up there, not your head. That's the wrong anatomy. But you don't you'd be kind and but you and I are the people that are normally intended to be on top of the water. That's us. We're supposed to be on top of it. Why is this going into these churches and, and finding that everybody's keeping their head above water? Most everybody's doing that. There's a difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. A non-Christian keeps his head above water. A Christian is supposed to be standing on it. I don't know if he's functioned normally. He's a water walker. He's a mountain mover. He's a, a, a tree tore, tore up, if you want to call it that. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be and it's what we're supposed to be. Now you get attacked, I know you will, but you still stay on top of it and you have people with you and help you. And God tells us in Psalms 1-3, his leaves shall, shall not wither and whatever he doeth shall prosper. You read that. There shouldn't be other withered people. Listen to this. If you're a Christian and you're doing the right thing, it shouldn't be withered. But if you are, we're headed someplace. Now I'm talking about withered in your spirit and your outlook, not just your hand or leaves. Withered in your personality, withered in your withered in your relationships. Personal or social. It's highly improper for the people of God to have withered authority as well. Withered ability. Withered right hand is a violation of the divine intention. You could see that. That's a picture. Now why is that? It's bothered me through the years. It has. I've had to be quiet at times. I've done it myself. And, you know, if I, as I travel through the years and come to a place and I'd ask about the church and certain things said about it. And, and then somebody will say, you really need to, to meet Sister So-and-So, Sister Jones. She's a godly woman. Yeah. Meet her. She's just a wonderful person. Now, the inference is this. Sister Jones is godly, and the rest are not quite so godly. When I went to these different churches, it was, okay, out there, this is not else. This is also a fact when you think of a congregation. You think of 
several outstanding people who are vital and, and virile and strong and powerful, and they're moving in God, and then you think about all the other people there that are not. They're just hanging on. It's, you just wonder why are you just hanging around? Withered saints, what happened to you? How come the power of God's not moving through you and for you? Why are they crippled? Crippled Christians, the withered saints. Why? Now, this is not an indictment. This is an evaluation with a view of getting healed and put back together. And that's what I went to many of these ministry churches and ministries for to help them get in there and get with it. They're supposed to live abundantly. And I you know how many of us at this point, we, we could say, Baker, now that's a story. And you're listening to it and going, uh-huh, yeah. But how many of you relate to that? You barely made it through this one. This ordeal was tough as last one. I barely make it through most of the time. Husband died, wife died, uh, sorrowful. My gosh, there's so many things could happen. Children dying. That's just one part of it. And I've done this for years. I've watched people go from crisis to crisis. Rough things have happened to me too. Now, that's not God's intention that we just barely make it through each crisis. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the idea that God's supposed to be with you. And the rest of the world looks on. The, the world is wondering, why should we just join them? They're just barely making it through. And they say they are in good shape. I don't want to join that sorrowful, sad-looking mess. Now, look at verse 8 on this. Verse 8. But he knew the thoughts. Ah, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Rise up and stand over here. Stand in the midst of him. I'll show him something. Now, God's involved this morning with all of us here as we've listened to this. Now, if you're listening to this because it's a, a good teaching, but if you come here for any other reason to listen to this, it's where we can you can get some understanding about it, maybe, you know. Or you're going to church because you, you come here to meet the Lord. Now, if the Lord is listening to this, God being God, he can not, not be against some things and for some things as you're listening to this. And me too. He's for things and he's against things. You can't change that. Now, you, can you think of anything God's disturbed about in your life? I do everything I can to get him out. Every man for himself on this one. Are you like the Lord? Do you like the parable we just looked at? Are you happy with this paralyzed? Are you happy with a paralyzed arm? Uh, are you happy with a sub attitude? Are you happy being depressed? Are you happy with these things? Do I have to live on the outskirts of reality of this? Do I have to see the city of God through a set of binoculars way back there? Am I not called to walk your streets? You are. You are. Jesus made you worthy. How come I have to fight to keep a little bit of faith and hang on all the time just to get by? Well, we'll make it. We'll make it to the end. Where's the abundant life he's been talking about? Where is that? How do I get there? I've told a lot of people. His name is Jesus. Now, I want you to understand this. God's against subnormality. He is. If we're subnormal this morning... God's on our case. He wants us picked up and brought out of that. But he loves me. I know that's why he's on your case, because he loves you. If he, he didn't love you, he wouldn't be on your case about it. God cannot stand to see his children with withered right arms. He just does it, can't stand it. No Israelite should be withered at all. That man should have been standing there, and that's what he, he uh, was upset about that. And he's kept in that condition because they're religious. Going to a religious thing. Now, I know that I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm not perfect. There, but I'm trying, right? But God's got something better. He does. Now God's got something better. Find out. It's more better. It's a better term for it. He's got something more better. Now, there are many withered areas in all of our lives. Withered faith, withered prayer, withered praise, withered witness, withered gifts, withered uh, emotions, withered fear should be right. 
Now listen to, I'll tell you something. Now, you can find an, a gathering of, quote, Christian people who will accommodate the area where you want to function in your subnormality. They'll stay there with you. It's okay. Nobody will tell you. Well, I would. And then you would hate me, as the rest of them did. And, and help you, not just talk to you about it. Now, if God's to bless you, you should be blessed for the right reason, shouldn't you? And you think about this. You should be blessed because you're, you're people that refuse to live with withered limbs. You just don't want to. There are people listening to me that are, are requesting the fullness of God, and you have been. Well, some of you quit, but no. otherwise we find our level. And the wonderfulness and magnificence of God, he allows a lot of people to live a long time with withered arms. I've watched it a long time. Did you know that Israel was out of the will of God for 40 years in the wilderness? 40 years. But he didn't withhold the banner from them. He didn't withhold the water from them. And he made the shoes grow on their feet and the clothes on their back. and never got to go to the store. He didn't withhold anything that way. He's a God of grace and he loved them. He'll take care of you this whole time. He will. Now listen to me. But do you know that every night as those Israelites laid their heads on that pillows and they cried and just deeply cried, wished to God we'd have gone in and now she shall never go in. We'll eat the man in the morning. We'll drink his water all day and we'll look at our supernatural clothes and shoes, but we'll never know what it is to go into perfection of his will. We won't know because we didn't do it. There'll be 1,700 more funerals tomorrow. 1,700 more corpses will be committed to the desert sands. Now, it's a rough way to go because you didn't believe him. I didn't want to live there, and I don't want to live there. I don't want to live there. Never do. I've ministered about this before. Go on in the promised land. It's God's will to heal our withered hand, whatever that may be. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus, he brought the whole thing to a crisis right there in verse 8. And he said to the man, stand up, come out here in the middle. Come out here and step out. Stand up and step out. Now, I don't know how long that man had been a member of that synagogue, but he'd been there a while. He looked around at everybody, and Sadducees and Pharisees glared at him. They, whoa, if you dare stand up and step out, we'll get you too. We're the lead of the heads of this thing. We'll eat you up. You'll get out of here right away. Now, was it worth it to come under the withering scorn of those people, nasty people, and jump out there and get healed? Or to submit to that, the withering scorn and rules, laws, the state putting me in? I've been there. No. Now, who wants their hand healed? Who wants it back? The strength and the power. A lot goes with this. It's your choice. Man didn't have to get up. Stand up, he said. Now that's the direction of deliverance. Everywhere Jesus went, he would, he would say, "Get up." Up is the a direction of God's up. God, got up with a shout. The <laughs> Lord, the direction of the devil's down. The direction of Jerusalem's up. Stand up, he said. Everywhere he went, lying, lying on pallets, he'd rise up. Get up. Corpse. He said, get up, corpse. <laughs> and corpse has got up. Now, up is the direction of God, isn't it? Yes, it is. Rise up. Now, come forth. What's the come forth thing? How to do that? The come forth is to make declaration in front of everything and everybody that I put my total confidence in the direction of the Lord Jesus and his word and his is a beautiful power. He said so, one but two, but everybody else says not to, but I'm going forth. I'm coming forth. Sometimes it's rough. You got to do it. That's your sufferance. The man came forth. The humiliation just hit him. What got your situation? Get out of there. Come on out of there. Now, I'm preaching for a verdict. <laughs> In a court of law, it's, give me a verdict here. Look at verse 9. Then Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to, to do good or evil, to save life or to destroy? Oh, 
Now, God's intention, as you listen to this, is not for you to find some kind of philosophical rationalization for your subnormality and where you sit, but God, I didn't have a chance. My father was an alcoholic, my mother was a prostitute and a drug addict, and I just really never had a chance, Lord. I really never had a chance. Well, all of us come from hard times somewhere, and even the good times is kind of rough, too. You can go over and above, still miss it. Now, it's the will of God this morning, as you listen to this, to do good. Always is. But especially right now, faith coming by hearing. I want you to, to know something else in verse 10. Jesus looked around at that crowd, and he was angry at them. I don't want to be the object. I do not. If you've ever been the object of his anger, <laughs> you won't do it again. Try not to. Don't be. Don't. You think the devil is something? <laughs> God, do him fearful of God. Now, it may people may people get angry at you to be healed and be well in every area of your life to be wholesome. Especially if you start making money. Oh, 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 they don't like you to be prosper. I think we're standing in Christ's day right now. And both of you who are listening are young. And submit to the Lord. And you submit to the elders who are following the Lord. And I think you need to put your will, withered hand there to, to the Lord Jesus. And let him take care of it. Now, Jesus is angry at everything that keeps you and me from wholeness. He's angry. It keeps you from healing. It keeps you from... Uh, growing, he gets angry with them. And the man stood up and came forth, and he was healed. As whole as the other one. Hallelujah. Now, I try to deliver it unemotionally, but I'm a very emotional person about this. Those of you who are listening to this, you stretch your faith out. you got something in your life that you need to stand up and, and get healed. Get that withered hand out of those emotions, out of your social life, out of your money life, your marriage, your business. Well, people aren't going to like you, baby. That's okay. Jesus will. I'd rather have people angry the rest of my life than have Jesus look at me rough, sideways. You be dealt with by God once or twice, hard. He deals with you because he loves you. He wants you healed. Why don't you take care of now Stand up, come forth, and get your, your healing. Father, we ask you that your anointing would touch people right now through this tape. Touch them through this recording. We're not doing tapes anymore. Touch them, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, please bring the kingdom of God to them. Those are those who are stretching out and, and doing their best to go to another level they want to. They're tired of all the, the, the witheredness in their lives. Touch them as you touched me, as you've touched so many. Help them. Pull them through. Whatever it takes, whatever it is, whatever you have to do, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I hope this has helped you. This is Mike saying Jesus is Lord. I'll see you next time.